wonderful. Well, I think we are ready to kick off. Um, I think now that that slide has gone down, it means that um, our attendees have managed to, to trickle in. Um, and so let's begin without any further ado. Welcome to this first event of um, the term for the Caribbean Studies Network here at the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. Um, this is our first event of the, the third academic term of the year. Uh, and we'll have another three or maybe four events um, later on this term. And you can find out more about those on our uh, page on the Torch website or on Twitter. Um, we're at CSN Oxford. The format today um, is that we're going to have four speakers. Um, the speakers will kind of collectively speak for about 20 minutes um, and then we'll have time for Q&A, plenty of time, about 40 minutes in total. Um, so if you have any questions as the speakers are speaking or during the Q&A, please uh, plug those into the Q&A box um, on, uh, at the bottom of the screen. So as I said, we're delighted to welcome four speakers today, um, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction for them all um, before, uh, before we kick off. So first we have uh, Adam Philogen Heron. Uh, Adam got his PhD from the University of St Andrews in social anthropology and he's now a lecturer at Goldsmiths um, and he's a PI of the ESRC funded project Caribbean Cyclone Cartography which is where today's um, session sort of really builds from. We're also very lucky to have Shaila Esprit with us. Um, Dr Esprit got her PhD in English Literature from the University of Maryland uh, and she's gone on to become one of the Caribbean's foremost digital humanities experts. She's now based at the University of the West Indies, and she's the founder of the Create Caribbean Research Institute, uh, which she founded in 2014, partnered with the Dominica State College. And we're very lucky finally to have two student interns from the Dominica State College with us today, uh, Kayla Ann Griest and Tracy Dewey. So as I say, those speakers are gonna to speak to us for uh, about 20 minutes. We were incredibly lucky to have four such expert, um, expert contributors with us. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this event. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, and I think Adam is up first, so take it away. Hi folks, I'm gonna very, very briefly share my screen as I've got a PowerPoint here. And then I'll pass right over to Dr. Esprit, who's going to introduce Create Caribbean. Um, so hopefully everyone can see the PowerPoint that I've just got up. Um, as we've mentioned, Surviving Storms, the Caribbean Cyclone Cartography Project, just briefly to mention that in the process of, of acquiring funding, Caribbean Cyclone Cartography gave a sense of what we're trying to do. We're trying to create an archive which is, uses a map a digital map as a means of locating various different stories of hurricane recovery in Dominica following Hurricane Maria, but also earlier storms of various different kinds that have affected the island. Of course, when you're moving around, Caribbean cyclone cartography can be a bit of a mouthful. So as a shorthand, surviving storms make sense because we're telling stories of recovery as well as identifying um, various different kinds of traditional architecture and their kind, of, their kind of resilient features, as well as looking at the oral history of earlier storms and so on. Um, there are various different components to the project, but today we're going to speak to you, and I'm communicating with you directly from Dominica, along with Kaylan uh, and Tracy, who are also in Dominica, and Shaila Esprit is beaming in from elsewhere in the region in Jamaica, where she's currently based. Um, so as you see in the image, We've been doing some video F F ethnography, and this is the students in training before they've gone out and done some field work. But the field work actually has been going for just two weeks. So we're, these, these notes are kind of fresh from live activities, fresh in the memory and recent experiences. I'm sure I've taken up well over three minutes um, of the five that I'm allocated. So I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Esprit and then you'll hear more from me shortly. And she'll just introduce the vision of Create Caribbean as the founding director. Thank you, Adam. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and welcome. Thanks for um, coming to listen to us today. Um, I began Create Caribbean in 2014 as in an effort to bring together multiple areas of interest. Um, I'm trained as a Caribbean literary and cultural studies um, person with specific training in digital humanities and in, in Caribbean digital studies. And um, I wanted a space in the Caribbean for Caribbean students where they could cultivate their 
intellectual and academic research skills, their creative skills um, in the arts and other areas of the humanities and bring together those areas with more formal intellectual inquiry that can have direct impact on our society, on our historical and heritage preservation, and also on policy making around issues that affect Caribbean people. More importantly, um, Create Caribbean was in its vision, um, a goal for Caribbean students to learn more about themselves and the, the region um, and to tell stories about their, themselves, their past, our future by, by them. Um, so ultimately it's a for students by students kind of program. And we have two main arms. One is the um, research and service learning internship program, um, which Kayla and, and um, Tracy belong to. This is for Dominica State College students who are um, basically A-level students who are taking this program. And we have our Create and Code Technology Education program focused on developing coding skills, programming skills, all with a social um, awareness mindset. So this is the original um, mission of Create Caribbean. In the past few years, we've done several digital research projects centered around Caribbean life, Caribbean history and heritage with a specific focus, of course, because our program sort of founded in Dominica, I am from Dominica, with a specific um, view to Dominican history, but with broader implications for the Caribbean. And we've worked with scholars in the Caribbean and in the United States and um, other parts of North America. So we were happy to do this partnership with Adam on um, the Surviving Storms Project. We have an environmental humanities arm of our um, program, which is really important to us long before we had Hurricane Maria. And we've been working on a similar project um, called Cari Sealand, Alternate Caribbean Futures, Caribbean Sustainable Futures, since 2015 in collaboration with um, a Caribbean author named Unia Kempadu. Um, she's sort of the artistic vision of this project and we have been working on various um, digital storytelling and um, historical research aspects of environmental um, questions in the Caribbean. So, this project is kind of timely and extends on what we've already done with Carousilland. And I am happy that we have this opportunity to give the students some practical hands-on experience with their digital humanities. They've taken a course in digital humanities research. They're familiar with some of the formal theoretical and methodological um, questions that we're asking about the Caribbean, about um, the way the digital can help us to tell better stories. And so I am excited that they have an opportunity now to put some of those um, that knowledge into practice and to learn more things about themselves, their communities, and what we might do in the future for the Caribbean through this project. So I'll take it back to you, Adam. Tyler, thank you so much. Um, and that really nicely introduces our collaboration. The way I've envisaged the notion of cartography or of mapping within this project is that the map represents an archive. Um, and it's a kind of counter mapping to think of the stories that are located in various different places within the Dominican landscape in different villages, in different places that, that um, the various people who will appear in the project call home. Um, and so thinking of the map that we aim to produce at the end of this, which you'll be able to click on different nodes on and it will bring up stories, it will bring up images of traditional houses that have withstood various hurricanes, it will bring up examples of various different kinds of adaptations towards a, a future of climate insecurity. Thinking about this map as an archive then enables us to, to actually document much of the work that's already been done. And Shyla is someone who's been doing the work and Create Caribbean have been doing that work. And so the map more than anything will create a space to, to, to demonstrate much of that work as has been already done by Carrie Sealand and other projects, um, but also to, to hopefully hopefully build on it in various different directions. Um, but I say that to say that we're not in reinventing the wheel. Uh, we're not creating something that's that's radically radically new, but actually hopefully creating a spotlight for much of the important work that's already been done and ongoing. So the vision of the CCC project, um, and then specifically the Dominica story project within that, I'm using CCC and surviving storms interchangeably here. Um, is for Dominicans to be able to tell stories about their own social worlds, about their own island, about their own lives, about their own histories, um, to help guide their own futures as well. 
As you see in the top image, um, immediately after Hurricane Maria in 2017, um, but similarly after Tropical Storm Erica in 2015, which both caused widespread destruction um, and the loss of life for many people and loss of livelihoods and homes as well. Um, immediately news crews and so on flew into the island and began to tell stories using the same kinds of tropes of destruction and devastation as you see, as you saw after um, Hurricane Katrina and after various different kinds of disasters around the world. And then shortly after that, those crews will have moved away and will have gone in search of the next story. Um, Dominicans, however, continue to live with the after effects of the storm. Similarly, they, the, the Hurricane Maria kind of punctuates the memory of people much as Hurricane David did in 1979. And from earlier field work, I, I can recall so vividly the presence of Hurricane David as a kind of a marker in time. The time before and after David was always punctu always position people's stories of their families, their, their memories of the economy, various different kinds of things. It kind of, it was a, there was a presence in the background. The Neighborhood Story Project um, is, a, is a, a kind of a engaged ethnography project based in New Orleans um, that emerged after Hurricane uh, Katrina that does similar to work and that we're really inspired by in this project. And the aim is for the aim was for New Orleans um, residents within a particular ward that was that was badly affected by flooding to tell their own stories um, against the grain of the stories which were being broadcast nationally and internationally about about New Orleans. Um, and the stories weren't always about the hurricane, and many of them since then in the neighborhood story project is still alive and well. Collaboration with the University of New Orleans um, is still alive and well. Still has its headquarters. Um, in the same local community that it serves um, and has various different writing workshops and these kinds of things. We used that model, but the aim rather than with writing was to use ethnographic film. And so we've had a series of workshops with Ricardo Liazola, who you can see in the bottom right photo of those four. Um, you can see a kind of a projector and someone holding up a phone. Um, we did a series of workshops with Ricardo where he talked through various different kinds of filmmaking skills, how to craft stories using film, starting with um, using a phone and then building up to the kind of equipment that you see in the very bottom right image that Gibran, one of our interns, is, is holding there. Um, and the students got some, some practice in making their own films. Ricardo, who's from Venezuela, um, so has his own relationship to the Caribbean, the Venezuela, Venezuela, of course, being positioned on the Caribbean Sea with close diplomatic relations with Dominica as well. Um, R R Ricardo came in and very generously provided some really, really interesting spaces for exchange, um, really, really interesting reflections and, and, and some useful skills in, in, in filmmaking or shared them. And then the students had their own practice or took on their own homework practice of of, of crafting their own narratives. Behind the kind of the, the conviction of the Dominica Story Project is, is, um, is an, a very simple and fundamental idea that, um, that Ayan Apadurai, um, an Indian American anthropologist introduced, which is the notion of research as a human right. We all as humans have faculties to reflect on and document our own lives and the social worlds that we inhabit. We all have the means to be able to tell stories and to be able to document these stories. And if we don't have the means, then we should be able to, we should have the right to. Um, if we see that as a human right, then to be able to, to, be able to develop research based on our own priorities um, is, a, is a foremost kind of importance for us. And so in the bottom two images, both with yellow in the background, you see an example of some of our interns in the field gathering stories of, of, of life since the hurricane, also before but not always centering on the event itself. Um, we're mindful that in this work, we don't want to reproduce the, the trauma or the, or the difficulty of those memories the, and, and continually take people back to the moment. But often we were also talking about the future, about how people would prepare for the oncoming season, hurricane season, which starts in June, um, and which feels as though it's on the horizon, how people have been affected by COVID-19 um, as they've been recovering from the longer effects of Maria as well. What people's hopes are for the future of their communities as well. Um, the, whilst we, we had some loose kind of interview, interview schedules, there was space for, for the students to ask the questions which mattered to them and also for them to bring in their own experiences and, 
engage in a kind of an, an exchange and thinking together with those who they interviewed from the communities where, we, where we've been working. I'm not gonna say much more than that. Um, I'd like to pass over to Tracy and Kayla Ann now, who are fresh from undertaking their own field work and have um, just on the, on the 17th and then on the 24th and 25th, we went out on some, on some field visits. Um, and just to share any reflections which they had really on that process, um, what it was like, what they discovered, what um, came out as being interesting to them and how that might have, might have spoken to their own experiences as well. Over to you. Hello. Hello. Um, my group, me and another intern, we did our um, session on Saturday. And we did two interviews that contrasted each other in a very interesting way. We did an older, we spoke to an older gentleman and then a younger man. The older gentleman had a, and he sort of had an air of um, hopelessness and acceptance because um, given his experiences with Hurricane David and then Hurricane Dean and now then Hurricane Maria, he had always been, you know, affected by hurricanes. And then, we had the, the um, perspective of the younger man who had had his first uh, hurricane disaster experience. And it was just a, a very good contrast in the same day, one after the other. It was very interesting for me to see. Um, the younger man was also stationed in a very dangerous place within his community. And I had only heard small bits of what had happened in that place because it was so, uh, the, the effect was so disastrous that everybody had heard about it. And um, so being there and being able to speak to him, it was like a movie he was describing and it was almost like thrilling. But then um, it was surreal to even be in the space that he was when those things were happening. And I just feel very grateful for having the access to that avenue by the project. And as someone who was there during Maria, it gave me a better outlook as to what happened and how I feel about it because so much had happened to the young man and it made me feel better about how positive he was. It made me feel like, you know, maybe we can do this. <laughs> it gave me, you know, another boost of confidence, a boost of motivation to stay strong and keep healing and move on. And this recovery and healing theme in the project very much resonates with me and I really like that. Overall, it was a very interesting experience. I learned a lot about myself, about the people I work with, about other people, and it gave me a newfound interest in research. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kayla. And, um, and over to Tracy, if you wanted to share any reflections, Tracy. Hi, my name is Tracy. So I did my field interview on April 17th weekend before last, and I interviewed um, an elderly woman by the name. I, okay, I won't mention her name. Um, she's in her mid 50s, early 50s. She, her experience with natural disasters has been a long one, lifelong, because she grew up when Hurricane David had passed. She lived through it as a young teen. She, experienced Erica and then she experienced Maria. So her whole life she's gone through these disasters and she told me from each one she didn't really she wasn't really as traumatized from them because like when they happened she would talk about it with her children, with her neighbors. You know she thought it was important to talk about things that happened even if it was small or big she believed that experiences like that had to be talked about so that people could feel less alone in them so they could kind of connect more people. She, there was a particular story she told me about, um, I'll just mention it briefly. She said that during Hurricane David, she lived um, in Lupia on the seaside and there were a young couple on a yacht out on the sea and the sea was getting really rough. And so they were trying to 
signal them to pull their boat in and come on shore and you know to get safety but the couple didn't see that it was that serious like they did not heed their warnings and a few days later after everything had passed and blown over they had found the boat wreckage a mile or two down the shore so she was telling me that from since then she's always taken it very serious so like at the first sign of trouble or change, she would get into action. Like she wouldn't wait for things to get bad. And so her overall experience with those disasters went as bad because she was always on some level prepared. And although she didn't have a formal education because she grew up slightly less privileged, she still understood things like I would or you would because she loves, she loves to read, she loves to listen to the radio, and you know, those kind of things really help her deal with her experience better. And hearing her talk about how those disasters impacted her and her family, it really made me look at my experience with the recent Hurricane Maria, because although I, my family, we weren't drastically devastated from the hurricane as in our house was intact. I just figured then I, I just feel okay, like nothing happened to us, we didn't get injured, so therefore we had nothing to deal with. But I guess it just made me reflect on a lot of things that happened at the time with people and just not pushing aside these small things, you know? Um, I think also another point she wanted me to pass on is that um, mental health is important to her. So, and it was surprising to me because in Dominica, the conversations around mental health and trauma and those things, it has a big stigma. It's usually not talked about or ignored. And so her being in that age bracket and talking about it, it was just a surprise to me because if she's talking about it and she's talking to her neighbors about it, then maybe there's more people that actually want to talk about it, but they're not getting the spotlight or the attention to be heard about it. And I feel it can be less stigmatized. So I really like that the project is involving people, the regular everyday people, people outside of academia, outside of the corporate world and really talking to villagers because I think that's what we needed. That's what that's the missing factor that we needed for a long time. Because people are not being heard and that's an issue. That's my piece. Thank you so much, Kayla Ann and Tracy for, for sharing your reflections. Before we opened out, and I'm kind of playing chair just for a moment until Michael jumps back in, because I know that's actually his role, so I'm not going to try try and dabble at chair for too long. Um, but just wanted to add briefly, or to ask briefly, were there any kind of challenges that either of you guys kind of faced in the process? Anything to do with, um, I don't know, whether it was nerves or whether things you found difficult or anything that you'd want to you'd wanna bring up that was challenging about the process? And if not, that's okay. I'm sure plenty will come out within the Q and A. Uh, you guys both did excellently, but if there were any challenges, feel free to feel free to jump in. I think the main challenge for me was um, approaching them because I'm not really a person to go and just start to talk to people or just to go and greet and introduce myself to talk. So, but then. Um, the other things like setting up or actually doing the interview or asking me questions and then letting the conversation flow, that was actually very easy because of all, you know, the practice that we had <laughs> before the workshops and so on. Um, 
um, from my part, I I didn't really experience too much difficulty. I think the only thing that was on my mind when I went into the interview was that I'm I wanted to connect to her. I, I didn't want to have any mental barriers up. Like I just wanted to let her be comfortable telling her story. And when I got there, it was a warm environment. So naturally everything just played out as it was supposed to. So I didn't have much of a challenge. Thank you once again. I'll pass over to, to Michael now. Uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we, we've got a question in the Q&A, which just builds really neatly actually on, um, on that point. And so Annabelle Wilson asks, how receptive were the citizens to doing interviews and telling these post-disaster stories? Um, so maybe that's a question for, for all of you as to sort of how you've found um, the process of kind of doing this type of community, um, community engaged research. Shaila, would you like to um, kick sure. off and any background? I can, I can jump in here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, before we started the Surviving Storms project, my students and I were working on another project with, um, for the carousel and we have an ongoing, um, what we call alternative, alternate Caribbean futures project um, where we are creating a lab, a design of a, a new model society um, using one of the villages in Dominica. And um, we had done some field work before and these are the same interns who are working on the Surviving Storms project. And they all came back to meetings saying, you know, nobody wants to talk to us. Um, Everybody was like, you know, are you the tax man? What are you doing this for? You know, a lot of people have a lot of reservations around participating in research. And I think um, from our, from our um, perspective as um, investigators and researchers, when we were planning this project, this is a question that we thought about a lot. We wanted um, participants to feel included in the project and to really know and understand what we were going to do with the information that they were giving us and how it will be used and that they were in control of the information because so often researchers come into disaster areas. I am a survivor of Hurricane Maria. I lived in Dominica and I worked as an administrator at the college at the time. And what I experienced in that we got a lot of help and we are super grateful for that. And um, we also had a lot of research Following that, a lot of um, organizations, uh, um, academics, a lot of research and attention and money being poured into the country as a result of, you know, to better study and understand storms, to make us more resilient, as is the, the you know, the key word in these, um, in these projects. And a lot of it centered on frameworks rather than people. Um, and it was striking to me that, that in all of the time that I've been doing Create Caribbean work and we've had some other projects when we talk to the people they always ask us the same question what 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 am i doing this for how is this going to help my life how is this and we have to really make a strong case for that and so i encourage the students even in those early stages when we were doing those initial interviews before surviving storms began to consider what they might say in response to that to be to for them to get more used to the discomfort of people being resistant to research because they have to understand the culture around that and the history behind why people from um, the global south may generally be wary of research, um, how they're being represented, how they're being studied and why. And so I think going into this project, I noticed that um, the, the, the students are more you know, practiced in that area and have kind of built up a thicker skin, but also more language to be able to respond when they get asked about those questions. Does anyone Tracy, else want to come in on that hmm. question? Tracy and Kayla Ann, were there any reflections on on that that point? Um, what I would like to jump in and add on that question is that my interviewer, my, my interviewee, she stressed a lot at the, towards the end of our session that what she's saying is that she wants her words to be shared. She encouraged us to even pass back and talk to her again because she has a lot 
of wisdom for her age and experience with this stuff. And one thing she told me that I kept with me was that living through all those disasters, she's learned to take a more peaceful approach to life. Like certain personal challenges and issues that she has in her own personal life, she will not dwell on it for too long. She's very peaceful and relaxed. So if somebody has a problem with her or she gets into an argument, you know, she'll just let it rest because she's so thankful and appreciative that where she was living during the hurricane, there were some casualties. And she was telling me that every time stuff gets hard or something difficult comes up, she would just remember that and be, and let go the problem. Like, it's not that deep. And she's grateful to be alive now. So she's just going to enjoy life. And yeah. For me, the people that I came across, um, we would talk about the, uh, you know, I would ask them the questions that I have to ask them. And then after we ease out from, you know, the initial awkwardness of the human just made a person, um, they would actually, I wouldn't ask them about you know, what happened during the storm, because personally, I knew a lot happened during the storm. So during that flow of conversation, they would actually start to unpackage that themselves. So I didn't really have to ask them what happened and how did they, I didn't ask them anything like that. They just started to, to give that out because, you know, we were asking about, you know, what are their hopes for the future and all those very nice questions to, you know, this recovery theme. And then they would start to explain what happened during the storm and how they felt before and after and what they look forward to just without asking for it. So that happened very easily. Just answer the question from Ava Winston. I might just jump in briefly and, um, and bring it back to Shyla's point earlier around that kind of sensitivity. There's a, so we're, we're in an island of, of of what was once 70,000, between 60 and 70,000, but estimates make the population to be something like 50,000 um, since Maria, although there's not clear statistics that I'm aware of in terms of the exact numbers of people on the island. And in a relatively close-knit society where people live at great proximity to, to one another and where people know specific family names, there's a deep concern with people veying or minding each other's business. Um, and that research that is too prying into people's personal affairs is something which people can be for good reason distrustful of and that's before we even get to the question of the extraction of knowledge from the global south to the global north um, and the kinds of research infrastructures that also reproduce that so just to give you an a kind of an insight into the nature of our funding the funding that we get comes from or came from the aid budget of the united kingdom and so interestingly their aid is often seen as a gift from northern countries to countries in the global, global south. Our attempt is to see hurricane, our, our research on hurricane repair as a kind of, um, as maybe a kind of a form of, of reparations, and maybe that's going too far, but there are historic, there's a historic relationship between Britain and the Caribbean that's deeply exploitative. And we wanna work out how we can shift this narrative from Ada's gift to something which is actually a form of um, redistribution of, of knowledge. And so there are many archives, for example, that exist in, in the UK that have greater information about Dominica that's often accessible to folks on the ground in Dominica. Folks in Dominica often never have access to a lot of the knowledge that might be behind paywalls as well about their own island. So we want to think about it in the course of this work about how the funding that we are using from up there, as people refer to northern countries, um, and how it can be repurposed down here for something very useful. Um, and in the process, treading sensitively, knowing that historical relationship and knowing the kinds of infrastructures that enable this project to be, to be undertaken. The extent to which we're able to push back against that might be limited or might be questioned, but in the process of attempting to resituate who's telling these stories, um, we're trying to do that work as best we can and constantly, constantly trying to reflect and question ourselves. So when folks that we're speaking to say, where's this information going? What's the purpose of this? What are you doing here? What do you want? Then we need to be, as Shaila said, ready to respond to those questions and also reflect on the practice. And of course, that 
in, in the process of this, I'm situated as someone of Dominican descent with a deep love for the island, but that hasn't grown up here and that, and that didn't survive Maria. I'm situated in a different way to, to Shyla, who's positioned in a different way to Kayla Ann, who's positioned otherwise to Tracy. So each of us will be reflecting on these questions. And we hope that the workshops and that the course of kind of eating lunch after we've finished, um, finished engaging in field work and each of these different moments can be a space for us to also reflect on that process, reflect on what that means, reflect on what that's doing, um, and reflect on our, our, our practice as, as researchers as well. All of us are lifelong students. Um, and hopefully we can be kind of engaged in that conversation together, despite it of often being difficult conversations too. Wonderful, thank you so much for, for those reflections. Um, I wonder if we could loop in um, a question we've had here, which is also sort of about the, um, the field work process and um, particularly the choice of sites. Um, and I see that Charlotte's already kind of mentioned this, but, but suggested that maybe there's there's more to, to say, which is how did you decide um, what locations on Dominica to, to address with, with this field work? Um, so the, the question sort of suggests that um, uh, the sort of impact of natural disasters like this are obviously differentially patterned across, um, across the island. And so how do you decide where to, to focus your attention and what impact might that have, I suppose, on, um, uh, on the work? Shyla, would you like to, or we can maybe kind of come at this together to speak about, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to. Yeah, I already what, answered yeah. in the chat, which was the point of, um, the point I made in the, in the chat was that, you know, we selected communities where there was direct adverse impact and also um, the likelihood of um, adverse future impact, right? These, these areas um, that, that we're looking at for the for purposes of the study have had over, the, not just for Maria, but in previous storms, a history with, um, you know, flooding or being too close to waterways, all different kinds of vulnerabilities that make them constantly the sites of the most um, disastrous effects of those storms. And so we were very interested in talking to people about this idea of survival. What you will find in many um, countries, I see there's another question in the chat that kind of speaks to that about whether interviewees see hurricanes as a part of life and is there a kind of a fatalistic sense of this? Um, I don't know so much that it's because of just about limited opportunities. People are tied to land, especially culturally and based on our history as um, uh, you know, plantation society, how um, a a former enslaved persons began to own land and, and have a relationship to land. Um, it's very difficult culturally to get people to move out of their location. Um, very many attempts have been made by the government to relocate entire communities and they're always like a pushback on that. Um, this is all part of our research questions and why we're thinking about these specific locations. So there are some communities, Kulubistri, Lubier. Kulubistri is sort of in the, on the West Coast, um, closer to the North. We have um, Lubier, which is south of the capital city, Roseau, also on the West Coast. We have Piti Savan um, as an area that, that um, suffered devastating loss and the tropical storm Erica of 2015 um, because of landslides um, and flooding and things like that. So, Adam, you'll remind me of the other, uh, the other ones, but these are some key um, areas that have always historically been vulnerable, right? And dealing with the idea of, yes, hurricanes are part of life. We spend six months out of our year thinking about hurricanes every year, right? And it's the luck of the draw every year, which, which island, which country is going to face the impact. So it's always this sort of sense of, um, you know, waiting just in case, but also people have a relationship to their land. There's a history there. There's a, a family story tied to, I'm working on a different project now that's all about um, a family relationship to land, right? So it's, it's going to take a lot of convincing and more work to think about what it means for people to be safe, to deal with hazards and to still keep that relationship and that rootedness in the, in the land. So just to just to follow up on what Shyla was saying, and there are so many different directions to go in this, but um, thinking about that question of family land and ties to the land, and also 
ties to a sense of home as well. In the post-plantation era, or in the, okay, let's move back a little bit further to thinking about emancipation. At the moment of emancipation, there were many people fled the, fled the estates which they'd been tied to previously and on in which they'd been bonded. Um, and, um, and, but they were, they didn't own the land on which their houses were situated, but there was a small strip of crown land um, around the perimeter of the island referred to as the King's Free Chains, um, which was a space that was common land that people would be able to, to squat, um, but that eventually people gained housing title to, to small plots. And so what you see is people densely packed along the perimeter of the island, the same very areas which are exposed to, to sea surges, but also people um, be, began to be able to buy up, and this would, would have been a little bit later, with saving small um, portions of land on the falaise, on the slopes, the end, the kind of the margins of the estate land as well, which were often places which may um, in some cases have been, and we've seen, um, be exposed to landslides and so on as well. So the socio-spatial dynamics of the society that emerged from the post-emancipation period um, and that continue to emerge through to the present with the former estate lands, those um, more kind of gently sloping land, which maybe aren't so exposed to hazards where many of the middle classes live and where I'm actually speaking to you from, from now. So we're situated in, 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 a, in a, um, an area very close to Lubia where we did some of the interviews um, are much less prone to hazards. And so the, the kind of the, the class-based contours in terms of who's most exposed to, to these kinds of hazards often kind of plays out who lives up on the kind of the, the safer areas and who lives more exposed to, to the coast and so on as well. So to think about the relationship to land in terms of who's most vulnerable and who's most exposed to these kinds of hazards is very important. But also to note that the, and this comes up in, the, in Jean Besson's work, who's actually, who's Jamaican anthropologist, one of my mentors, who I think is logged in on the call as well, um, she writes extensively on family land in Jamaica, but you see similar things here where families will have their, their small yard plots around the house, but also they have ties to land in the heights, which will often have been kind of hard fought for and which becomes an important site of identity and that becomes indivisible as well. One ancestor will bequeath it to multiple descendants um, in many cases. And so it's each family would have their kind of portion or a lot of families, not necessarily all, would have their portion of family land in the Heights, which is often worked by one of the ancestors where people make their gardens. Or importantly in Dominica, people refer to them as the Zion. Um, their Zion up in the Heights, the place that cultivates their food and often feeds their families, which, which has historic ties as well to the provision ground, which is an incredibly important site of autonomy, which enabled enslaved people to engage in their own marketing of vegetables and so on, um, and gain a sense of economic autonomy, even when their bodies were owned by someone else, according to the dominant law of the land, although they knew themselves to be themselves and to be free in many ways. Um, but that's just to say that there are ties to land, which means that, and me and Kayla Ann have spoken about this extensively, um, about Piti Savan, that even when the village has been relocated formally um, to another part of the island um, in these newly built um, kind of residential housing schemes, people from the village still return every weekend, if not multiple times within the week, to their homes in the village that doesn't have, um, doesn't have access to mains electricity from the, from the national grid, that doesn't have um, access to, or formal access to water from the national water service, but they'll still return to, the, to their village and to their gardens because of the importance and significance of that land and of, the, of their, their plots to them. Um, so there are many layers in terms of the land dynamics, I'm sure I've not picked up all of them, but much of that kind of underpins what we're doing in this project. The last thing I wanted to mention, it actually connects with another work package, is that we've got um, we've got a, a scholar research associate, um, Gabriel Abraham, who's also doing GIS work to identify the various different hazards in the different communities as well, using um, satellite as well as uh, drone kind of imagery to identify different vulnerable parts of the landscape so that not only we engage in these conversations, but we're hopefully able to then share maps with people that identify different areas of, of, of risk and of danger, as well as, um, as, well as uh, the various different adaptations which have happened in the village. People will be aware of these, but to be able to see them kind of from above and to be able to see a, a kind of a village, a village plan of these various different kinds of hazards can hopefully inform people's decision-making and also um, 
can also be a kind of a point to, to talk through to better understand these various different kinds of hazards locally as well. I've spoken way too much, so I'll mute myself now. No, that was um, that was absolutely brilliant and just such a kind of wonderful sweep of um, uh, the relationship between the project and kind of these these ideas of land tenure um, and the way in which you know as as we kind of so often see what we're dealing with here are um, in many ways the sort of long afterlives of um, first of enslavement and then of um, the sort of particular way in which emancipation was was carried out and the the sort of historical legacies of that. Um, so thank you for, for that. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in. Um, I want to just pick out one of them actually on the basis that the, the Caribbean Studies Network, we sort of you know, endeavor to be as regional as we possibly sort of can and to kind of think about things um, in, in that sort of regional perspective. Um, and we have a, an anonymous questions coming here about um, whether this research could also be used as a sort of comparison with other countries. So Puerto Rico, for instance, that have been hit by a storm uh, of similar scale, but not able to kind of recover as, as quickly. Um, or that, you know, whether essentially sort of Dominica is a, a sort of point of comparison perhaps for um, uh, recovery and resilience else, elsewhere in the region. Um, Michael, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, after the hurricane in 2018 at the Caribbean Studies Association and Conference, um, I presented on a panel about Hurricane Maria with someone who was writing about Barbuda who had just experienced Hurricane Irma. Um, I had um, with Yar Yarima Bonilla, who is a sort of Puerto Rico expert on, um, on Puerto Rican studies generally, but more specifically, she's been writing a lot and speaking a lot about the what, what she calls in her book, The Aftershocks of Disaster, and um, how that plays out in Puerto Rico. And also Maya and Alyssa Trott, who write um, extensively about environmental studies. Um, my, Maya is a environmental, um, an environmental scientist, and they both write about Guyana and Belize um, and environmental concerns there. And um, the panel was really to, re to think about the, the way the Caribbean as a region um, constitutes a uh, can constitute a sort of um, collective response to various types of disasters, whether natural disasters and sort of the man-made um, effects of natural disasters, right? Because they're always, natural disasters are not occurring in isolation from those things. And I think that's why the contrast is also important. We started that as a, a, a possible collaboration of sorts and that, that has been coming in the works, but I certainly see the surviving storms um, model of um, participatory research as a form that will that can really translate well in giving us a comparison. And I like that Adam um, came to this project thinking about New Orleans and Katrina and how that had played out in the, the Black South. Um, that's something that I was still living in the US um, when Katrina happened. And I remember how um, shocking and naive I was at the time that it happened because you know I had just maybe started graduate school very, very young and um, had never seen that kind of um, neglect on a, such a massive level of a society in the face of hurricanes. You know, I grew up in a hurricane society and we, all, we always had this sort of sense of um, collective preparedness at the very least. Um, and experience it in a racial way in the United States was very um, different. And I saw traveling after, after Hurricane Maria, I traveled quite a bit um, and stopped in Puerto Rico and spent nights in Puerto Rico and noticed in the over the, a period of time, how Dominica was getting progressively better, and Puerto Rico was staying exactly the same, and it's and I mean the Jones Act has a lot to do with that, and the resources that Dominica was able to garner immediately following um, the storm had a great impact on that. But I certainly think those questions need to be asked in that context um, about what kind of how what does the survival look like in that. Um, in that space. I think the book, The Aftershocks of Disaster really presents a good case for that. And there is a Puerto Rico syllabus. I can't remember the link right now, but it also provides a space that we can probably consider some kind of comparative analysis um, following this project. Um, if we, um, I know that Yari knows about this project and that it's um, on, ongoing work. So it's definitely a possibility and we've already been having conversations around it, around this kind of comparative nature of thinking of the Caribbean vulnerability as a more um, 
holistic kind of experience. And of course, how politics and economics impact that even Haiti and the earthquakes and so on, um, all of these different factors. I don't know if Adam wanted to add to that. I don't have much to jump in to add to that, but just to, just to kind of to note, and then I and then I want to open up something which is kind of related. Um, uh, Schwartz in his book Sea of Storms, which is a kind of a history of the Circum Caribbean, um, a deep history of Circum Caribbean hurricane, effectively, he refers to hurricanes as region making phenomena, and interesting that they kind of that the ecology and the meteorology of the of the region don't respect the dividing lines that um, that various colonial projects have attempted to mark and score throughout the Caribbean. Um, and neither do people, neither do the residents of the islands themselves, whether during the colonial era or the ongoing colonial relationships of Martinique and Guadeloupe to France or of Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands to, to America or the British Virgin Islands to the UK. Um, and even those that are still reckoning like Dominica and most parts of the Caribbean with the after effects of, of, um, of the plantation and of, and of British and of British um, rule within the region, people themselves have always cross cut and moved across those boundaries. And one thing that is really observable and has been observable in the, in the, in the long aftermath of Maria, but also in the context of the hurricane of the volcanoes in St. Vincent right now, is that within each of these moments or in the context of each of these, um, each of these events, there are incredible forms of Caribbean solidarity that play out um, and that we're seeing in an appreciation, I probably, and I think a deeper appreciation because of the effects of, of Erica and Maria where, um, where Dominicans immediately have seen what's going on and will share it in WhatsApp statuses and on Facebook and various different means of, of, of sharing information will not only share the, um, the images, the scenes from the, on the ground and from people's, direct from people's cell phones that have been forwarded multiple times, but that will also share various different ways of and create their own ways of, 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 um, of sharing resources and providing support as well. Um, just a, a banal example, but I'm a member of a, of a hiking group and immediately within that, the WhatsApp chat for that local hiking group, immediately someone who, who, has, um, who uses a specific line of local boats to send things back and forth between islands um, they were immediately like, okay, what's needed? Water because of the ash getting into the water system. Let's try and send as much water as we can from Dominica. And we saw that in the context of, of Hurricane Irma before Maria struck Dominica, where resources were shared with, um, with folks in other islands of Antigua and Barbuda. Um, and we'll see that to come in various different kinds of, kinds of events and disasters like this. Um, and I know just from our conversations with the, the interns as well is that is that there's a sense of of a kind of a of a common Caribbean because we often talk about the weather and how it affects different parts of the region and they're seeing the same WhatsApp statuses and seeing more than me because of course they're tapped into a deeper and more extensive network here in Dominica than I am myself. So I can I can see those kinds of those 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 kind of commonalities kind of playing out and the, the solidarities playing out as well on a day to day basis in our in our interactions too. I realize that me and Shiloh have started speaking lots and lots, but I don't know if, if Kayla Ann and Tracy wanted to talk at all to the St. Vincent context or anything else that we've, we've mentioned so far. Do feel free to jump in, of course. And it doesn't have to be all highfalutin and Caribbean studies here. It can just be based on your own observation. Back to you, Michael, I think. Sure. Um, so we probably only have time for kind of one more very kind of quick uh, set of reflections as we're, we're approaching the end of the hour. Um, and there are a few questions here um, in the Q&A which sort of speak to the question of what this project wants to um, achieve in the future. I guess like what the, the sort of end point of this might be and what you hope that it might um, uh, sort of achieve looking forward. So um, I think we probably have time for sort of 30 second reflections from, from everyone, if you have a, a kind of goal for what, what you want to, to see this do. Um, 
Um, I can start. Sure. I I was very clear with Adam when I when I decided to join in on this project when he was writing the grant. And I'm a survivor of the disaster. I'm a survivor of multiple disasters in the Caribbean since I've been back living there. Um, I wanted to think about the future. Carousilland, if people are familiar with Carousilland or if you go to our website, you will see that our, um, our goal is to create sustainable Caribbean futures. Um, this is the idea for me. So whatever work is happening now um, in our project, in um, part of our project called the lab, we ask a question of our participants or our interviewees, what kind of world do you want to live in, right? If we ask to reflect on the past, what was your experience with the hurricane? We have just three. What is your experience now? How do you experience your neighborhood? How do you experience your environment? But also, what do you want to see in your, in your community going forward? Um, I think that is a fundamental question for me, framing everything that I do at Create Caribbean is about um, Black futures, it's about Indigenous futures, it's about Caribbean futures. Um, and I think this is why the students are so important to the project. It's because they are going to be policymakers. They are going to be the, the next big digital studies person that you talked about at the beginning of this. I am simply here to kind of help them think about what that future looks like. And so I think the project, our, our um, research, our interviews are really to help us reflect on the past in sort of a cliche way in order to think about what kind of future can we, we are the ones we've been waiting for, like June Jordan says, right? What are we doing now to make that possible? Um, so there's always this futuristic element to the work that we're doing. And I hope that this particular project will help us um, design or contribute to what we were already designing at Create Caribbean in terms of model futures, both in the curriculum um, and in policy, in helping to, part of our project in Carousel is to talk to policy once we have a digital demo to, to work with. So that's for me on the practical end. Adam, off to you. Um, that was an intentional silence just to let um, what Shaila was saying breathe because I don't have a huge amount to, to add to that. Um, the one thing that I would note is that I would hope that people who come across the work that we're doing in various different forms um, can, can use it as an opportunity to, to learn from stories, from observations, from various different findings of, or their own discovery of things which, is, which have been ongoing for a long time in Dominica, that there's a long history of the kind of repair work that we're talking about um that we've tried to illustrate in, in glimpses here and uh, i hope that that can be a part of a longer process that extends from the plantation and even to the the points of european contact and the various different moments of, of violence as well as ecological destruction and that can inform some forward-looking sense of repair and if people can learn in the process from any different glimpse or anything that resonates throughout the course of this project and that can enable people to, to enable some connect as well between folks in this kind of policy making arena um, with the folks who Tracy mentioned earlier, everyday people in villages who they've been communicating to, to have more conversations going on there that informs what, what, what we might be referring to as resilience um, that enables us to forge safe, viable, healthy futures. Um, I think if we can contribute a small part to that, then that's what, that's what the project is there to do. I'd love to give the last word to either of the or both of the interns if they have anything to, to add, Kayla Ann or, or Tracy. So my goal or vision for the project is to as um, Adam and Dr. Esprit mentioned earlier that the project is sort of a visual archive for histories. I think, um, I just want to see it complete. I don't have any specific direction for it to go in, but I think it's important because when you look around in the Caribbean, you don't see much history about, compiled history about disasters and how it affected the people. You see bigger stories like generalizations so I think having more individual specific stories 
could help future generations to know like what happened before them, what they can do different, just to overall advance the Caribbean in how they move forward in developing. I also think that the personal stories are very important because, well, personally, I work on the archive section of the Surviving Storms project, and I'm having a hard time in finding, you know, personal narratives from any source. And the most the closest thing that I've ever gotten is dispatches from the governor of Dominica who was giving a first-hand account of a hurricane. And, you know, it really highlights the need for these stories to be broadcasted, to be shared. And it's also, it's, it's balanced in that it allows people to have an avenue to speak about this, this thing that happened. You know, it's not just that, oh, it happened. Okay, move on. It happened. And, you know, you get to talk about that. And it's not about, like, so much reliving it. It's letting it out of your system and connecting with other people on this shared experience. And I really like that. Wonderful. I think that's a fantastic point on on which to end. Um, this is such a vital and an urgent project. Um, and in the context, obviously, as, uh, as has been mentioned of what's going on um, in St. Vincent at the moment, um, incredibly timely as well. So thank you so much to, to Adam, to Shyla, to Kayla Ann and to Tracy. Um, here's to those processes of, of repair across, across the region. Um, we have another event coming up for the Caribbean Studies Network on the 11th of May um, at 2 p.m. on the Haitian Dominican borderlands um, and full details of that um, are, are in the pipeline and very soon very soon to come so do keep up with us on our website or on our Twitter um, and we hope to see you at another event very soon so thank you very much for coming. <laughs>